All right, so let's dive into this. You're in downtown Toronto, and you're wondering, do these bike lanes actually cause traffic jams? Or is that just drivers complaining? We've got some research to help us unpack this. Okay. And um, surprisingly, we're going to start with a fascinating study that takes us all the way to Budapest. Yeah, Budapest. It might seem like a strange place to start, but trust me, there's a connection here. This 55-year study, they looked at traffic patterns on the Danube River bridges. Okay. And it reveals some really surprising truths about roads and traffic. Okay, I'm intrigued. What did they find in Budapest that could help us understand Toronto's bike lane situation? Well, they were looking at how changing a bridge's capacity affected traffic volume. Think of it this way. If you add more lanes to a bridge, does the traffic actually get better or worse? Hmm. Seems like common sense. More lanes should equal less traffic, right? You would think, right. Okay. But here's the thing. The study found that increasing road capacity actually often leads to increased traffic. Really? Yeah. It's a phenomenon called induced demand. Induced demand. Okay. Break that down for me. What is that? So imagine you make it easier to drive somewhere, whether it's by adding more lanes or building new roads. What happens? I don't know. More people drive. More people choose to drive. Maybe instead of taking the bus or riding a bike or people who used to live close to work, now they might decide to move further out because their commute is suddenly easier. So you're saying that building more roads to try to reduce traffic can actually backfire and attract more cars. That's kind of mind-blowing. It is. It's a bit like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You think you're solving the problem, but you're actually making it worse. And the Budapest study found that a 1% increase in bridge capacity actually led to a 1.06% increase in traffic. Now, it's not a perfect one-to-one relationship, but it shows that adding lanes doesn't magically solve congestion. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So how does this connect back to Toronto and the bike lane debate? Mm -hmm. Are we saying that removing car lanes for bike lanes might not cause the traffic nightmare some people predict? It's definitely something to consider. The researchers themselves pointed out that there's been limited research on the traffic impacts of taking road space away from cars and giving it to bikes or buses. You know, studying these changes could give us exciting new insights into induced demand in cities. Exciting for traffic researchers, maybe. But for the average person stuck in rush hour, I'm not sure excitement is the word that comes to mind. Fair enough. But think about it this way. If induced demand is real, then maybe removing a lane for bikes won't cause a huge traffic increase. Because some drivers might choose other options. It's not as simple as less road space equals more traffic. Okay, I see where you're going with this. So while this Budapest study doesn't directly answer our question about bike lanes in Toronto... It does give us a new way to think about the relationship between roads and traffic. Exactly. And that's why this research is so valuable. It challenges our assumptions and forces us to look at the issue from a different perspective. So Budapest has given us a lot to ponder. But let's shift gears now and focus specifically on Toronto. We have a study on the Bloor Street bike lanes. Right. Which looks at the economic impact and what businesses experienced after the bike lanes were installed. I'm guessing this is where things get really interesting for our listeners in downtown Toronto. You bet. This 2019 study compared Bloor Street, which got bike lanes, to Danforth Avenue, which didn't. And what they found might surprise you. The study found that businesses on Bloor Street actually reported more customers and higher spending after the bike lanes were installed. Wait, hold on. Are you telling me bike lanes didn't kill business? They might have actually helped. That goes against everything I hear from some people. It's true. And vacancy rates remain stable, too. So it wasn't like businesses were shutting down left and right. Now, it's important to note, this is just one study. And it doesn't mean bike lanes are like a magic solution for every business district. Right. Correlation doesn't equal causation. But it definitely challenges the idea that bike lanes are automatically bad for business. Absolutely. And the Bloor Street study offers some clues as to why this might be. They found that people who arrived on foot, by bike, or transit, they actually tended to visit stores more often than those who drove. That makes sense. If you're walking or biking, you're more likely to just pop into a shop on a whim. You're not, you know, circling the block trying to find parking. Exactly. And here's the kicker. Those non-car visitors, they spent about the same as those who drove. So even though they might not be making huge purchases every time, they're still contributing to the local economy in a big way. So connecting this back to our original question about bike lanes and traffic, could it be that while bike lanes might reduce space for cars, they attract a different type of customer who visits more often and spends money? 
It's a fascinating possibility and one that deserves more research, but it suggests that the impact of bike lanes on businesses might be more nuanced than we initially thought. Yeah, this is all really interesting, but I know our listeners in downtown Toronto are probably still wondering about the impact on traffic. Did the Bloor Street study look at that at all? So it didn't focus specifically on traffic flow, but it did acknowledge that some merchants had concerns about parking and congestion after the bike lanes went in. Yeah, that's a common worry, right? People think less space for cars means instant gridlock. Did the study back that up? Actually, no. While some parking spots were removed for the bike lanes, the vacancy rates, they remained pretty steady. This suggests that the loss of on-street parking didn't actually have a major negative impact. Hmm. So maybe the parking apocalypse some people were predicting didn't actually materialize. It seems that way, at least on Bloor Street. Of course, every street is different, and what works in one location might not work in another. But this study provides some valuable data to challenge the assumption that bike lanes automatically equal parking chaos. Right. It's good to have some actual evidence instead of just relying on anecdotes and assumptions. Absolutely. And to be fair to those concerned merchants, the study did mention that some of them did experience challenges with deliveries after the bike lanes were installed. Okay, that makes sense. Delivery trucks need space to stop and unload. Did the study suggest any solutions for that? It didn't go into specific solutions, but it did highlight the need for cities to think carefully about managing deliveries in areas with bike lanes. You know, maybe dedicated loading zones or off-peak delivery times could help. Yeah, good points. Sounds like this requires some collaboration between businesses, city planners, and delivery companies to find solutions that work for everyone. Exactly. And this highlights a really important point about this whole new mobility conversation, you know. It's not about pitting cars against bikes or any other mode of transportation. It's about finding ways to create a system where everything works together, like a well-choreographed dance of transportation options. Yeah, I like that analogy. And that's where things get really interesting, because cities around the world are coming up with some incredibly innovative solutions to these transportation challenges. Ooh, I love hearing about cutting edge ideas. So give us some examples. What are other cities doing to manage traffic and transportation? Well, we touched on a few earlier, like cities considering car bans or limiting vehicle registrations. But there's also this growing trend of using technology to create smarter transportation systems. Okay, now we're talking. Technology could be such a game changer. What kind of tech are we talking about here? So think smart roads. Roads embedded with sensors that can collect real-time data on everything, from traffic flow and weather conditions to the weight of the vehicles. Whoa. That's wild. It's like giving the roads a brain. What kind of benefits could we see from that? The potential is huge. Imagine smoother traffic flow, shorter commutes, fewer accidents, and better informed infrastructure decisions. This is starting to sound like a futuristic movie. Yeah. But this is actually happening in cities right now. It is. There are pilot projects and trials happening all over the world. Wow. So could investing in this type of smart technology be part of the solution to Toronto's traffic woes? It's definitely an avenue worth exploring. But remember, technology is just one piece of the puzzle. We also need the right policies and regulations to encourage people to make more sustainable transportation choices. Right. You can't just throw technology at a problem and expect it to magically disappear. So what kind of policies are we talking about? Well, one that's been gaining a lot of traction is congestion pricing. So that means charging drivers a fee to use roads during peak hours or in congested areas. Hmm. That's a bold move. <laughs> Sounds like it could be politically tricky, though. But I see how it could be effective in getting people to maybe think twice about driving. Yeah, it definitely has its challenges. But cities like London, Stockholm, and Singapore have actually implemented congestion pricing with some pretty positive results, like reduced traffic, cleaner air, and increased use of public transit. So there's a precedent for it. It seems like those benefits might be worth the challenges. A lot of people think so. And it's part of this broader trend of moving away from the idea that we can just keep building more roads to solve traffic problems. That's a really important point. We need to be more creative and look at the whole transportation ecosystem, not just focus on cars. Exactly. It's about using our existing infrastructure more efficiently, encouraging sustainable choices, and investing in technology for a smarter, more connected system. All great points. But before we get too carried away with the future of transportation, let's circle back to our listener, who's thinking about those bike lanes in downtown Toronto. Any final insights from the research that might be helpful for them? I think the key takeaway here is this. The relationship between bike lanes and traffic, it's complicated. It's not as simple as, you know, 
bike lanes equal traffic jams. Right. We've seen that induced demand can play a role. Yeah. And the Bloor Street study suggests there might even be economic benefits to consider. Exactly. It's about finding that balance. That works for everyone. And that balance might look different in different parts of the city. Yeah. So what works on like a busy commercial street like Bloor might not be the right solution for a quiet residential neighborhood. Absolutely. Context matters. And that's why it's crucial to have data and evidence to guide these decisions. Data over dogma, right? Couldn't have said it better myself. So we've been talking about these big global trends in transportation. And I'm kind of left wondering if cities are moving towards, you know, more buses, bikes and pedestrians. Does that just mean we're trading one kind of traffic jam for another? That's where things get really interesting. The focus isn't on just cramming more vehicles onto the roads. It's about managing and even reducing the total amount of traffic. Okay, but how do you convince people to ditch their cars, especially in a car-centric city like Tarama? It's not necessarily about forcing anyone to give up their car. It's more about making other options so good that driving becomes less appealing. Hmm. Imagine a world-class transit system that's fast, frequent, comfortable, way better than being stuck in traffic, and safe, well-maintained bike lanes that make cycling a real option for getting around. And let's not forget about walkable neighborhoods, right? Where you can just stroll to the store, grab a coffee, meet a friend, without even thinking about hopping in your car. Exactly. Making those short trips easier and more enjoyable without a car, that's a big part of the solution. I love the vision, but I can almost hear our listeners in downtown Toronto saying, that all sounds great, but what about the traffic I'm dealing with right now? Will these changes actually make a difference in my you know, daily commute. That's the million dollar question. And while there's no instant fix, the research suggests that shifting to a more balanced transportation system can actually lead to less congestion overall. Really? How does that work? Well, remember that concept of induced demand that we talked about earlier? When you reduce the road space for cars, it can actually lead to fewer cars on the road over time. So you're saying taking away a lane could actually result in fewer cars. How does that make sense? It might seem counterintuitive, but when driving becomes less convenient, people start looking for other options, right? Maybe they switch to transit or they dust off their bikes or they adjust their work hours to avoid those peak times. And as these shifts happen, the overall volume of traffic can actually decrease. So it's not about creating gridlock. It's about nudging people towards, you know, smarter choices. Exactly. And that brings us to a final thought for our listeners. As Toronto continues to evolve and embrace these new transportation ideas, think about how they might impact your own choices. Could making a shift towards more sustainable transportation, walking, biking, transit, could that actually be the key to not just less traffic, but a more enjoyable city for everyone? Something to think about as you navigate those downtown streets, whether you're on four wheels or two. That's all for today's Deep Dive. Catch you next time.